So, this is kind of a red letter segment, at least in terms of reviews or unboxing videos. Do a YouTube search for just about any piece of consumer electronics gear and you'll get no less than a handful of results. Now do a search for the Mini DSP 4x10 HD and you get... So, it looks like I'll be the first to log my hands-on experience. And right away, if you're going to drop half a grand on a piece of gear, the expectation is that you'll do your homework beforehand, visit the manufacturer's website, check out the specs, download the manuals, etc. So I'm not going to spend too much time reciting the literature, instead I'll document my experience in getting things up and running. If you're just getting into this sort of thing, a digital signal processor, or a DSP, is just that. A device that performs some kind of digital processing over the input signal. It could take the form of a filter, an equalizer, a compressor, a limiter. It could even be a digital effects unit for reverb, echo, flanger, what have you. It's kind of a broad term. And that immediately begs the question, what manner of digital signal processing does the Mini DSP 4x10 HD perform? In short, whatever kind you want. Just as your computer can be a word processor one minute and a video game the next simply by changing out the software, this thing can be a mixer, a crossover, a graphic equalizer, a time alignment tool, a compressor, a parametric equalizer, or combination thereof simply by changing out the control plugin. Mini DSP does include one such plugin with the purchase of the unit through their website, or if you're buying through Amazon, a coupon code will be included in the box. Just make sure that you're actually signed in to minidsp.com before navigating to the address on the coupon card. I figured that out so that you don't have to. Anyhow, being a bit of a stickler for sound quality, one of the things that drew my interest to this unit were the balanced inputs and outputs, which translate to maximum noise rejection across the entire signal chain from the sound source to the amplifiers. Just as a refresher, an unbalanced cable will carry two conductors, signal and ground, and the length of it will act like an antenna picking up stray noise along the way. A balanced audio cable will carry three conductors, signal, inverted signal, and ground. It'll still pick up noise much like the unbalanced example, except that when it reaches its destination, the inverted signal is flipped so that it's in phase, and the noise is also flipped so that it's out of phase effectively, cancelling itself out. You may have noticed that I keep my gains wide open. This lets the amplifiers operate at their full dynamic range, with the volume being controlled further up the chain. This also means that the slightest bit of noise anywhere along the signal path will be amplified, so a high signal-to-noise ratio is a must if the speakers are to be dead silent when nothing's playing. That being the case, we'll obviously be using the balanced inputs and outputs, which on this unit take the form of three Phoenix terminal blocks. As you can see, they're basically just removable banks of set screw terminals designed to accept bare wire. What's cool about that is how easily you can make a pair of balanced cables from a single XLR or TRS patch cord. Just cut it down the middle, expose a little bit of the bare wire, shove it into a terminal block and screw it down. Apart from actually equalizing your speakers, this will be the most time-consuming part of the setup, so let's skip forward to look at how this unit integrates into my signal chain. Up top we have the computer running the studio software, Ableton Live as it happens. The software talks to the audio interface, which in turn sends two channels of sound over to inputs 1 and 2 on the DSP. Those are the blue cables. The DSP will be set to take everything above 50Hz and pass it onto an amplifier through outputs 1 and 2. Those are the orange cables. It probably wouldn't hurt to label them. And of course that amplifier powers the left and the right speaker. The DSP can also be configured to sum the two inputs and route everything below 50Hz to a single mono output, so number 3 why not, and send that out to the subwoofer amp. That'd be the purple cable. And there it is in black and white, and several other colors. This is how the Mini DSP 4x10 HD will integrate into my signal chain. And that's just using three of the eight available balanced outputs, so you know there's room for plenty of creative expansion. I could eventually buy amp the speakers. I could even set a couple of the spare outputs to pass a full range stereo signal over to a dedicated headphone amplifier. Like this one, that's totally not a for token of a future video. Besides, according to the diagram, I would need a yellow cable. Oh, okay, whatever. The point is that you can DSP your freaking headphones. So, once the rainbow spaghetti mess of wires is in place and the control plugin is loaded up on the PC, we can select what part of which input signal goes to what output. We can also apply time correction. Case in point. My subwoofer is on the other side of the room and it takes 6 extra milliseconds for its output to reach the listening position. So that's what we want to delay the left and the right speaker by. Lastly, a diligent RTA session with a parametric equalizer on every output channel should make quick work of any trouble spots along the system's frequency response. And just to top it all off, the unit offers four separate all-encompassing memory slots, so you could, for instance, mimic the sound of four different kinds of speakers. 
The way I've set mine up is that the first preset gives you a flat response from 10 Hz to 20 kHz. The second preset adds a Fletcher Mountain curve for even loudness. The third preset disables all the outputs going to speaker amplifiers and turns on the output going to the headphone amp. And the fourth preset is just blank, at least for the time being. So, to conclude, the Mini DSP 4x10 HD is an exceptionally versatile analog output management solution. As expected, there is a noticeable improvement in sound quality going from the Mini DSP 2x4. And, of course, no shortage of cool possibilities employing all the extra outputs. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a sound demo, bearing in mind that YouTube caps the audio stream at around 165 kilobits per second. Which also brings up an interesting question. What speaker or headphone setup do you play your streamed content through when sound quality matters? Looking forward to your comments down below. Cheers!